Oh, good morning. We're going to break bread thinking about Revelation 21 and 22, the New Jerusalem. Now, this is a vision of the kingdom here, Revelation 21 and 22, about the, the coming down of the New Jerusalem, Eden restored. This is a vision of the kingdom, and this is what Jesus died to achieve. Our whole lives, aren't they, are focused upon the things of the Lord Jesus and the things of the kingdom, and they're together, because what he died to achieve, which we're going to remember in bread and wine, is the kingdom. And we're going to focus then on what he died to achieve, and what is our absolute certain hope and future eternally. Let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come here to draw aside from the world and from our own flesh, and to focus upon the Lord and his death and resurrection, his body, his blood, and to remind ourselves of that wonderful future that is assured for us. And as Father, we seek to understand we pray that you will open our eyes, that we might draw closer to you, and that we might be encouraged about how we shall spend our eternity, so that this brief moment now might pass the quicker, and that we might realise again that this in this life is but our light affliction, which is but for a moment, that is preparing for us that far more eternal and exceeding weight of glory. Help us, Father, to get it, to understand it. And we pray, Father, that that might be so for all your children in whatever crises they are facing, be it the loss of faculties, be it the loss of health, be it facing death itself, be it persecution, be it the loss of all that they once held dear in their domestic lives, in their business, whatever sense it might be, we pray, Father, that we might all look to the end and see this wonderful eternity that is before us. Help us, Father, for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of all that he died to achieve. Amen. You've got to remember, when you're reading the book of Revelation, that it was given for a primary audience. That's true of all the Bible. And the art, if you like, of interpreting it is to understand that, okay, this was given for them in that context, and what does it mean for me now? Well, this book, this revelation, was given to Jewish Christians, I suggest, who were being tempted to go back to Judaism and to the cult of the temple worship to be led by the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. They were largely Jews who had been baptized in the first century, at least up to AD 70. And, well, there was a big movement back, I'm afraid, to their roots. You wonder what happened to all those thousands baptized on the day of Pentecost. Well, you read the book of Hebrews, James, and Peter's own letters. He was the one who baptized them. Then he writes to them in his letters. You can see what was happening. They were drifting back to Judaism, to Jerusalem. They were persecuted to start with, but then they made a deal, it seems, with the Jewish temple authorities. And of course there was a big wave of nationalism leading up to AD 70 and the Jewish war, whereby people thought that, Jewish people thought that we can get the kingdom of God now by our own strength. We, through heroism, through martyrdom, can kick the Romans out. And yet there were others in the first century who were tempted to assimilate in another way. And that was to accept the cult of empire, whereby Rome was basically the kingdom of God. And the Roman Empire was what, to, was, what was to be sort of pretended to, and citizenship in that empire, having Rome as the centre of everything. And believing that Rome was the eternal city and the empire was the eternal kingdom and Caesar was Lord. Revelation speaks directly to that. And how does it speak to us, we who do not live in the first century? It speaks to us in the sense that we likewise are surrounded by a system, by a world system, that is absolutely antithetical to the things of God's kingdom 
and there is no assimilation possible. There are two camps, and you're in one or the other, and you cannot be in both. So, you come to the New Jerusalem, which is a theme I want to explore here in Revelation 21 and 22. Well, this is radical for both those groups, the Jewish Christians and also Gentile Christians tempted to fit in with the cult of Roman Empire. Because they're being, we're being told here, there is only one city, the new Jerusalem, not the old Jerusalem, which is going to be destroyed. And the real temple is the Lord Jesus and the body of Christ. We are the temple of God. Not Jerusalem. We're going to read in, in chapter 21, and I saw no temple there. Well, when the temple, the physical temple was destroyed in AD 70, that was the end of the world for a lot of Jewish folks that all their hopes and aspirations were over now. And their big stress was on this physical temple and Jerusalem, the physical Jerusalem. And what they're being shown here is, no, it's not about that at all. Actually, yes, that will pass away, but all that is the physical and the material, which is absolutely irrelevant. There will be no temple. There is no temple in the kingdom of God, in the new Jerusalem, in how it's going to be, because you are the temple. You, people, are the city of Jerusalem. And the true Jerusalem is that a Jerusalem that is above, that, as Paul says, is the mother of us all, not the human Jerusalem, the physical. And you may say, yeah, fair enough, and what, what cash value has that got for me today? Well, <laughs> the world around us is seen as the ultimate, that this is the ultimate reality to get a cool pension pot uh, and to clear your mortgage on your house, and a very nice house, beautifully furnished, by the way, to have a couple of really nice cars, get your kids through university, and have a holiday home, by the way, that also is much sought after in a beautiful location, by the way, and to make sure you're up to the hilt with health insurance and eating healthy food, and blah, blah. And that's about all they can offer. That's it. And, of course, that carefully avoids the ultimate question that there comes game over. That even if you achieve that, and most people don't achieve anything of it, they achieve little bits of stepping stones towards it and then it's game over because they, they die. You know? What rubbish compared to the ultimate reality that we have of the heavenly Jerusalem, the things of God's kingdom and eternity. So do not be sucked in by materialism. Don't be sucked in by, as it were, the empire. Because God's kingdom is antithetical. That is, it is the absolute opposite to the empire of this world, the kingdoms of this world, which are passing away and are to become the kingdoms of our Lord. So you read there in chapter 21, I saw verse 2, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. The holy city. Well, all the time, Babylon is contrasted with Jerusalem. Babylon was known as Suana, the holy city. So the two cities of Babylon and the New Jerusalem are absolutely in conflict. The New Jerusalem is decked with jewels. So is Babylon, the whore. The New Jerusalem here is a beautiful bride. Babylon is a whore. You've got these two cities in absolute diametric conflict with each other. All the things, the nasty things, the lies, the idolatry and the perversion that are listed here as being outside the city of the New Jerusalem are inside Babylon in Revelation 17. There is no compromise. Now, if you live in the first century, Rome and to be part of Rome, oh, this was the ultimate. And Rome, the city of Rome, was the ultimate, really. Uh, but it's painted here as in Revelation as a whore that is going to be destroyed, against whom there is the wrath of God, and you've got to come out from her. And it's the same with the, in, the level of interpretation that can apply all this to the physical Jerusalem, that, oh, our eternal temple, our eternal city, Jerusalem, the eternal city, Oh, yeah, we are the true people of God. No, that's all going to be ripped apart. As the Lord said, not one stone left upon another. And that's why 
When you read the seals and the vials in Revelation, the bowls, especially the seals, they're full of allusion to the Lord's prophecy on the Mount of Olives where he said that you see this temple and this Jerusalem is not one stone will be left upon another. It's going to be wiped out, going to be taken out. And all those signs he gave of that happening are extended and alluded to here in Revelation. I don't want to go into the actual interpretation of the book, but I would say that any interpretation that does not give due weight to all those massive allusions back to the Olivet Prophecy, something's wrong with it, because it's not interpreting scripture by scripture. You can't possibly tell me that that's, oh yeah, all those allusions from Revelation back to the Olivet Prophecy are all, well, yes, um, uh, ho-hum, yeah, well, not particularly relevant, just, uh, just chance. And it's, it's not, come on, uh, that, that, that's not the case. You've got to interpret scripture by scripture. Revelation, therefore, was clearly given before the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in AD 70. And it's saying that this is going to happen. And it's the devotional point is, if you're a Jew, tempted to go back into that what appears to be the solid, eternal temple cult. No, don't go back. Same, if you're in, in Rome, you're a Gentile, and you, oh, you look to Rome and think, ah, Rome's going to last forever. If you can't beat them, join them. It's all passing. It is all not going to save. There is another reality. So then, <clears throat> Paul, of course, in, in Hebrews 12, talks a lot about this heavenly Jerusalem. He says that we have come to be associated with the Jerusalem that is above. Same idea, this new Jerusalem. And Galatians 4 is very clear, where he says, Jerusalem, which now is, that's the physical place, is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So then, it's the Jerusalem that is above that is the, is, is the significant point. Now, in the letters to the churches, in Revelation 3, verse 12, the Lord says that, for him that overcomes, Revelation 3:12. I will write upon him the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my name, from, from my God. So then, <clears throat> that New Jerusalem is there. Okay? It's there in heaven, as it were, and it's going to be transferred from heaven to earth. So then, Jerusalem then is put in contrast with Babylon and physical Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is in contrast with those things. You can't be a citizen of more than one city. That was the point, I think. And we are citizens of God's city, of God's kingdom, of God's empire, not the empire around us, not the empire of Rome, etc., so that's the idea, very, very clearly. And so we want to know a bit more about well, what is this new Jerusalem? Well, you read on here about the dimensions of it in verse 16. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And you measure the city with the reed, 12,000 stadia. That's 300 and something miles. Length, breadth, and height of it are equal. This is a cube. The New Jerusalem is a cube. Now, in Solomon's temple, and you've got the dimensions in 1 Kings 6, verse 20, the most holy place was a cube. The temple itself was not a cube, it was like a rectangle. Right? So, it's saying that the whole city, the New Jerusalem, is the most holy place. And that is why you're going to go on and read that we shall see God's face. That there in the Most Holy was where the actual presence of God was between the cherubim over the ark, the covenant box that was in there, on top of the mercy seat, which was like a lid, if you like, on top of the, the box that was the ark of the covenant, the cherubim over it, and the blood of atonement sprinkled there, representing, Paul says, the blood of Jesus, and there over the blood of atonement between the cherubim shone the glory of God, the presence of God. And so, we will be in the presence of God and we will see his face, we are told. 
This is the idea that we will be in the presence of God and the whole city is a cube. The whole city is the most holy place. But then there's a big emphasis in verse 17 and following from verse 17 on the wall. On the wall, and it's got gates in it. There's quite a bit of description about that, far more than about the city itself. The wall, we're told, is great and high. And the wall is 144 cubits high. But the city itself is 12,000 stadia high, which is about 300 and something miles. Well, how much is 144 cubits? 144 cubits is about 65 metres, which um, is, I think, 215, 215 foot, according to what I figured out. I think in metres, not in feet. But anyway, 65 metres. 215 foot, which is not that high for a city wall. And the city itself, see the wall is built outside, and then you've got the cube of the city, which is like 350 or whatever miles tall. So the, the wall is very small, apparently. And don't forget, Jerusalem is being contrasted with Babylon, and Babylon was famous for its huge walls. The walls of Babylon were well, about twice the height of this, 144 cubits. So you think, wait a minute, something's funny here. Why is the wall not very impressive, apparently? Well, then you get this enigmatic statement that I think answers that in verse 17. It's 144 cubits, this wall, according to the measure of a man, yeah, that's human cubits, which is also an angel's measurement. Now, sure, these are enigmatic words. Here's my take on it. The idea is that, sure, 144 cubits according to the measure of a man. You know, that's like 18 inches or, or whatever. Um, the tip of your finger to your elbow. Yeah, but it's the measure of an angel. And I think the point is that what seems absolutely small and not very impressive in human terms. According to the measure of a man, it is the measure of a man, but it is used by God and it becomes something huge. I mean, if the city is 12,000 stadia tall, because it's a cube, uh, 12,000 stadia each, each dimension, then the wall is going to be phew, way bigger than that. Yeah. In other words, what seems absolutely not impressive in human terms <clears throat> <coughs> is used by God and turned into something amazing. That's the point. Here I am, here in the, the, the church here in Riga, which I pastored for 20 years. This all started, actually more than that, this all started in 1992, when I stood here in the city, outside the, 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 the train station by the big clock, where there's that busy pedestrian crossing. It was busy then, it's busy now. And I was handing out little green leaflets that said, write to me at an address in the UK and I'll send you whatever, Bible literature and so forth. And I got one back that had a footprint on it. In other words, someone had taken one of those little green leaflets, looked at it, chucked it on the ground. Someone else had walked on it, put their footprint on it. Someone else had picked it up. He wasn't interested either, but he gave it to his old father, who was interested and who wrote. And we got in correspondence and came and baptised him. You see, yeah, this random bloke standing there, this, you know how it was in this country in the early 90s, Everything totally crazy, revolution, everything going on. And from one little scrap of green paper, thousands of baptisms since, and the uh, group that we, we now have here in this city, meeting here in this hall. So, from what man despises, from what seems tiny, from what seems a not very impressive wall compared to the great wall of Babylon, Yes, that is accord the measure of a man, but also the measure of an angel. The guy standing outside the big lima clock there in the centre of town here, Riga, uh, handing out the leaflets was just a man, just me, just a bloke, nothing special. 
but there was an angel there. It was also the measure, not just of a man, but of an angel. And so it is with this. And th this is why Revelation turns everything around, that witness is the word martyr. Martyrdom, death, apparent victory for the beasts and Babylon and all that, becomes victory. Becomes victory. It turns into what Buechner called the magnificent defeat. And it's the same, of course, with the Lord's death, who was, Revelation 1, the faithful and true witness or martyr. The magnificent defeat, despised and rejected of man, there he is, dead as he's dead now. Got him now. Couldn't come down from the cross, could he? No. His death there was a lifting up in glory. It's a total inversion of all human value. And what seems to men, actually, it's the very opposite. And so, it is, as I say, with our lives, with the things of God, that what seems despised in the eyes of men, as Paul says to the Corinthians, is great in the eyes of God. So then, <clears throat> the wall great and high, which men would have said, oh, it's only 144 cubits, it's not very great, it's not very high. Yeah. In the New Jerusalem, in God's way of doing things, that is absolutely wonderful. That is huge, big enough to be a wall that can even be bigger than a city that is a cube, 12,000 stadia, 350 miles high. And so, of course, you know, the, the message was to those who wanted to trust in the, in the physical temple or in the, the strength of the Roman Empire, that no. <laughs> you may think that the New Jerusalem is nothing. It's huge. <laughs> Much bigger than you. But we do wonder why there should be a wall and why there should be gates in it. Because the picture you get as you read on here is that finally there are only us inside the city. All opposition has been destroyed because there is only there are only two groups in Revelation. There's the people of God, the followers of the Lamb, and the followers of the beast. And that's it. And of course Jesus wins. And all those who are outside the city, the dogs, the idolaters and all that, these are all destroyed. So why then would there be a wall? Well, a wall could symbolize a lot of things. I, I don't think you can say it's there for defense because eventually the city of God, it's just us. The, there is nobody else, as it were. I think it's the sense, therefore, of security of eternal security. Now, I have often said to you, now, look, you've got to believe that if Jesus dies now, or if, if you die now, sorry, if you die now, or Jesus comes back now, then you are going to be saved. And that is what we must believe. But we are all not perfect and constant 24-7 in our faith. There is always those niggling doubts. I've sinned so much. Is, is his grace enough? I've, I've been so just uncommitted is he really going to do it? That We shouldn't have those niggles, but I'm afraid because we are human, we do. And <clears throat> the idea of the huge wall, I think, is not to defend us, we don't need any defense, but is to show us that you are secure. You are eternally secure. No more doubt. No more fear. The one important thing I know in the bottom of your heart is, will I be in God's kingdom? That issue will be, will be resolved, secure. Later on, we're going to read in chapter 22, and there shall be no more curse. Well, you could read that as there shall be no more cursed thing. Well, the allusions are to the Garden of Eden, and that what was cursed in the Garden of Eden, well, was the snake, maybe the serpent. There will be no more possibility of sin. There will be no more possibility of temptation. And that for me is a very attractive dimension of eternity, of salvation. So what's the kingdom going to be like? Well, here's what it's going to be like. No more temptation to sin. When it labours the point a couple of times that there will be no more sea. Well, I don't think it's talking in literal terms. I think it's talking in terms of, of the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, in Daniel, the beasts come up out of the sea. Here in Revelation, likewise, John looks at the sea and there emerges the sea beast out of the sea. There will be no more sea. That is, 
There will be no more environment which spawns evil. It's not only that evil will be hit on the head and the, the dragons and their followers, etc., destroyed, but there will be no more environment which creates that stuff. And that, as I say, is for me a very attractive idea. And this total personal security for us with the Lord forever and ever. But the wall has got gates in it. And you wonder why that is. Well, I'll give you a couple of options. I mean, one is that although here apparently there are only the people inside, there are nobody, there's nobody outside. All those outside are eventually destroyed and die. Uh, but maybe there's the suggestion there that ultimately there will be a gate, as it were, an opportunity for others to enter in and be and live with us in the cube, in the most holy place. Who those people might be, who those entities might be, I don't know. Well, that's something to scratch your head and think about. That is beyond, of course, our possibility really to imagine. But there's something else here. Those 12 gates are named after the apostles of the Lamb, who are just ordinary blokes. You know, Peter, the fisherman who denied Jesus, who cussed and swore that he never knew Jesus and all that stuff. Very doubting, questioning people. Unless I see the marks in the hands and feet, I won't believe that he's risen from the dead. Even after they'd seen Jesus twice, John 21 says, they said, oh, let's, I'm going fishing. I'm just going back to the old and familiar. Very weak men. And I think the idea may be that out of that weakness comes something glorious and eternal. And I think, however, though, that the, the existence of the gates may be to remind us, or not remind us, we're not going to have a failing memory, but to, well, be an abiding message to us all that I entered that I entered this holy, most holy place, that I entered this kingdom. The Lord says <clears throat> that the gate now that leads to his kingdom is very narrow and few find it. And the way that leads to destruction is very broad and many people go down it. So I think that the idea may simply be that we will for eternity be aware that I entered in here. I was not born in here. I came in here by God's grace. And there you see the huge significance of baptism, that then a person entered in to Christ. You see the significance of, of the Lord's words that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, and I think he's referring to the little gate where just a human being could enter, than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. The camel had to get down on its knees, have all its wealth taken off its humps, and then it could just squeeze itself through the little needle gate. There's the big, huge gate where camels could walk through with all their, their baggage on them. And then there's the needle gate, the little gate, where just a man could walk through. And Jesus says, you know, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. You see, in the kingdom, we will always forever be aware that there was a gate that I entered through. That I wasn't born here, I came here, I entered in here. I think that's the idea. And there you see, what a warning against materialism. You know, who wants to be rich? Who wants to have their pumps full of, you know, stuff? Houses and, and wealth and, and, and all this kind of stuff. It's going to stop you getting in the kingdom. It's going to make it really difficult. So I could say, no, it is difficult, but I can manage that. No, you can't, Jesus says. It's very difficult for you. Don't risk it. Because in the kingdom, we will be aware forever that I entered by a gate. So then, just to go a little bit more into this new Jerusalem. Let me just emphasize again that the new Jerusalem is us. It's people. Right? Because it's clothed as a bride. I mean, the wall, it, again, the wall represents people. It is not literal. You know, it's 144 cubits. It's 12 by 12. The 12 apostles multiplied by the 12 tribes of Israel. It's, it's quite clear. 
And as I said, you've got to be careful that you don't slip into a sort of an excessive, inappropriate literalism about that city called Jerusalem. I'm not saying it is insignificant, not at all. But the New Jerusalem is not the Old Jerusalem, that's the point. And the New Jerusalem, which is clearly the focus here, is in heaven. Now, what does that mean? If the New Jerusalem is people, and the people come down with the church, arrayed like a bride for her husband, for Jesus, well, what does that mean? That we are alive in heaven? No. Let's be clear, the Bible teaches quite clearly that death is unconsciousness. And if you have any lingering doubt about that, go back to Bible Basics, chapter 4, about death. Death is unconsciousness. We are not conscious after we die. It's very clear. I, I believe we're all on the same, uh, same square on that. So then, why then in Revelation do you get several times visions of believers in heaven, and souls under the altar, in chapter 6, crying out for vengeance and God telling them, just wait a minute and I'll get to you soon kind of thing. Uh, why, why this kind of thing? Why? Well, I think the why is because although death is unconsciousness, all live unto God. He is not limited by time, space kind of frames and constraints. The spirit shall be saved, we are told, in the day of judgment, 1 Corinthians 6. So although, yeah, we shall all be changed physically when the Lord comes, when we die in this life, he remembers us. And he is right now preparing for us the nature of our eternity. Jesus is preparing a place for us in the temple. And I think, you know, when he says, in my father's house are many, are many rooms, I think he's alluding to the temple and the chambers for the priests. And he's saying, look, I'm going to prepare a unique room for you in your service. He that overcomes, the Lord says in Revelation, in the letters in Revelation, I will make him a pillar in the city of my God, which is the New Jerusalem. And yet, although that is all future, in another sense it is now, because in Galatians 2... Paul talks about brethren like Peter, who he said were pillars in the church. We're told that Jerusalem, that, that is above, is free. Galatians 4. The heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, is free. And yet, Paul says, for freedom did Christ set us free. The city is the temple. I will write upon him the name of the city of my God, which is new Jerusalem, and yet, clearly, that city is the temple. The whole city is the cube, which is the most holy place. And we are now the temple of God. So, what I'm saying is that as you go through life, we each have unique works that we're supposed to do, prepared from the foundation of the world for us to do. We are each unique in our relationship with God and with Jesus. And we therefore have a unique reward. We will be given a stone, with a, no, a white stone with a name written on it that nobody knows apart from you and Jesus. That is, there is something totally unique. Just as a city is made up of people and you, streets and, and stuff like that, well, we each are somehow unique. Okay? And the nature of our eternity is being prepared now in heaven, in this new Jerusalem that is there, where our focus should be. Now, salvation is by grace. In the parable, all the workers are given a penny a day, including those who worked harder than the guys who hardly worked at all. So, sure, it is not of works lest any man should boast, that is clear. But works are also going to have their eternal consequence. I come quickly in Revelation 22, verse 12, to give every man according as his works shall be. So there is an element to which how you have lived now, the things you've done with your life, will have their eternal consequence. It's quite possible, I suppose, that you may believe in Christ, in the Lord Jesus, in, in his blood, his death for you, and yeah, you'd be in God's kingdom, but actually you, what, you've frittered your life away 
on a career and on enjoying yourself and all this sort of rubbish that's all around us. And yeah, you'd be saved, but your experience in the kingdom will be wonderful, of course, but will not be as rich as someone like the Apostle Paul, who says that, you know, he will have those who he, uh, he converted and worked for as his joy and crown eternally. He says that to the Philippians. You, he says to the Thess Thessalonians, are my joy in the day of the coming of the Lord Jesus. When I see you in the kingdom, well, that will be an eternal dimension of my joy in the kingdom of God. This life is very, very short. Do not be caught up with this materialism, pleasing yourself, having a great time, trying out you know, food that tickles your taste buds and going here to see this sunset and going there to see that mountain. Oh, rubbish. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. You can use your life to transform other people's lives to the glory of God, probably people in your own street, people in your own hometown. That's what you can do. And that is what's going to last. And that is what's going to make you a wealthy soul forever and ever in the kingdom of God. The other stuff you will not remember and will just pass away as sand falls through your fingers. All that is rubbish. All that is just this life. It is relationships that count. <coughs> <coughs> and as you come on here, <coughs> in Revelation 22 you get this idea more and more because the picture of eternity which we are given is of Eden restored and the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God being eaten, etc. And there will be no more curse and we shall see the face of God. In the same way as Adam saw God's face, and God went out for a walk in the cool of the evening and chatted with Adam and Eve, and they were in perfect fellowship with him before they sinned. This is the picture that we are being given of eternity. It is about relationship with God. And he goes on to, to say that, sort of by the way, and they shall reign forever and ever. He says, they shall see God's face, they shall eat the fruit of the tree of life, they shall see God's face, and they shall reign forever and ever. It's clearly all about Eden, right? There will be no more curse, sure, eat the fruit of the tree of life, yes, that's Eden. They shall see God's face, yes, just as Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden uh, saw God's face. And they shall reign forever and ever, yeah, that's Eden as well, because in the Garden of Eden they were told that you are to have dominion, which is to reign you are to have dominion over the beasts, and you are to have dominion over this. You are to rule over, manage, if you like, this garden. And we shall do that forever and ever. So that's the picture of eternity, seeing God's face, no more curse, no more temptation, the great walls around you of absolute some solid certainty that this is forever, and it is not going to come to an end, and I have no more possibility of sinning, and reigning, as Adam and Eve reigned, or were told of, to reign in Eden, doing God's work. That is what it's all about. Now, if you don't want to do that in this life, if you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's just go to church now and again and get that over and done with, and, oh, yeah, well, <clears throat> hopefully I'll, you know, I'll get out of the grave, and hopefully death won't be all for me. Well, you know, would you want to be in the kingdom of God? If that's your attitude? Do you want to 24-7 be in the presence of God and doing his work? Is that, does that turn you on? Does that attract you? Well, for me, sure, I'd sell my soul. I've sold my soul for that. Absolutely. I want that. Please. By grace, I'm sorry I'm a sinner, but you assure me that that's okay, that you've forgiven me, and yeah, that's it. You see, this is the danger of religion, <clears throat> that you can live the life of the guy next to you who's an atheist, and then, oh, well, yeah, I hope, <clears throat> well, I won't think about it too much, but I hope, yes, because I've been to church, and yes, I accept this, that, and the other proposition, that even I'll get around death, this is like the best life assurance policy, that I shall actually get out of the grave and get resurrected and be given eternal life. And that's not bad. But let me get back to the, uh, 
Let me get back to the show. Let me just uh, put that thought to one side. I'm just watching this uh, serial on TV that's really interesting or whatever. No, you see that? You're missing. You're missing so much. <clears throat> this is what passes for religion. Churchianity. Denominationalism. This is how it goes. And you see, there's so much more. Can I get this <laughs> over to you? There is so much more. There is relationship with God. To see the face of God. Now that won't mean nothing unless you love God. Unless you're deeply convicted of your sin that I, oh, oh, how could I have done that? How could I be like this? But I am. Oh, but he's going to forgive me and he has forgiven me and I'm going to see his face and reign forever and ever. That is, do his work, have dominion over the beasts. No more snake, serpent, no more source of temptation, no more sea environment out of which the beasts and evil can arise. Secure with four huge walls around me, secure in his love, knowing this is not going to end. Wow. You see, that's what's in front of us. And you know, it's all possible, is it not, because of what the Lord did. And he shall make all things new. That's 5, chapter 21. Behold, I make all things new. And the idea is not that he's going to destroy the physical heavens and earth. No, these abide forever. But it's going to be changed. And that's the point. You and I will not be destroyed, but we shall be changed. The idea of I shall make all things new is that I shall renew them. They won't be destroyed, but they will be renewed. And we also, I'm not going to go into nirvana, that is total non-existence. No, we shall be changed. I, the little boy from South London who wore national health specs when I was a kid. Yet yeah, I, I will live forever and so will you and I will see the face of God. Well, this is the whole thing that, that I, you, will be saved. Salvation is personal. That is the whole idea, that we as persons will be saved. Sure, we shall be changed. It's, it's very encouraging. On the other hand, it's fairly challenging because we are not happy with who we are. I do not like every part of how I am. It emphasizes the huge importance of personality, of character, of spirit, and the need to change because how we are to some degree is how we shall eternally be and it's the same with this repeated idea that they do not need the light of the sun and the moon because there will be this everlasting light of god's glory which of course we also have seen in in, in that sense <clears throat> that we we have seen that that light the light of the knowledge of the glory of god in the face of Jesus Christ. And yet we're told here that, Revelation 21, the city has no need of the sun nor of the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God did light it, and the lamp of it is the Lamb. So the city doesn't need that. But then in chapter 22, we are told that they, the servants of God, do not need the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, for the Lord God shall give them light. So we are the city. The city doesn't need any light. We will not need any light. And this is alluding to the prophecies in Isaiah that the light of Zion, the temple mount, <clears throat> shall arise. A huge light will appear in Zion. Isaiah's prophecies, chapter 60 in particular, seem to say. And it will shine, we are told, eternally for day and night. The idea is that Sure, the sun and the moon and all that will be there. They will not be destroyed. But the light in Jerusalem, which is the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, will be so huge that sun and moon are eclipsed, as it were, in their importance. And I think you take a message from that because a lot of the pictures of the kingdom of God that you get given are very physical. Oh, wow, there shall be a perfect climate. Frankly, I can, can care less if there's a perfect climate. Because it doesn't turn me on at all. Ah, oh, there, there'll be uh, wonderful uh, harvests. Yeah? Uh, it doesn't turn me on. I, I, I'll be honest with you. And I don't think that that is at all the emphasis. Sure, this is how it will be. Yes, there will be a perfect climate and there will not be whatever, global warming or whatever you're worried about. Yeah, absolutely. 
but all that stuff is eclipsed. It is nothing compared to being with God and seeing his face and seeing the glory of God on the face of Jesus Christ. That will be the light that is so bright, that sun, moon and existence of the whole thing. Yes, this will go on, but it will just not be relevant compared to the wonder of relationship. Now that is my point, it, that the wonder ahead is the relationship. If you're looking at it in physical terms, like it's a tropical beach holiday that actually has no end, I think you're missing a lot, to put it mildly. A tropical beach holiday that has no end would be absolutely awful. I mean, you really want to stay on that beautiful island or wherever you go for your holidays, you know, forever, you know, zillions, zillions of years. I mean, you get out of your mind. And it would be, frankly, selfish. Frankly selfish. No, the kingdom of God is essentially about relationship with God and with Jesus. That is the message of the New Jerusalem and the message of Eden restored, of doing his work, doing his will 24-7, with no break, with no humanity, no ties that bind, getting in the way. That is what is on offer. But it's only attractive. If you have been convicted of your sin, if you think, well, I, did, I would so love relationship with God, but I've got this sin as a barrier. That's dealt with. That is dealt with. And the future is glorious. Ever and ever and ever. And all that was made possible. Wasn't it? You know. Whatever, 2,000 whatever years ago. On a day in April, on a Friday afternoon, on a hill just outside Jerusalem, a man beaten, punched, covered in blood and spittle, teeth knocked out, hated, everybody screaming, every expletive and every bit of hate that they had <clears throat> in, their, in their soul of that man, who endured it, who carried our sins, who saw to the end, and had that vision that no other man had or could retain. That by doing this, by giving his perfect life, his perfect mind for us, we might have a share in this wonderful eternity that is ahead. Let's thank God. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he did what we have not done and would not have done. That he gave his life, his body, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to you, to that wonderful day when at last we shall see your face and we shall serve you forever and ever and reign forever. We thank you, Father, that you are preparing that eternity for us now. We long for the day when it shall be transferred from heaven to earth. We pray that we might think about the things of the Lord Jesus and the things of his kingdom, and that these things might take over our whole lives. For his sake. Amen. Heavenly Father, we take this cup of wine seeing in it the fellowship of the blood of your dear Son. Father, this is, we consider, the highest honour that man could have, to take this cup in memory of him. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that he will soon return, and that at last this wonderful, wonderful situation shall come about upon this earth, and at long last we shall be with you, and with him, and as you, and as him, as we dearly wish. From the bottom of our hearts we thank you with every grain of gratitude.